Good morning and welcome to the recording for Riverside Baptist Church's service for May the 17th. Uh, we are halfway through the month of May already. It seems unreal how quickly things are uh, going by, but at the same time, it seems like it's been forever since we've seen uh, many people in person or had a, a live church service. And let me just encourage you to continue to be patient because we are um, trying to decide what is best for both our spiritual need to worship and to gather together, but also balancing the biblical command to not abandon our worship together on one hand with the command to love our neighbors as ourself, to do what is good for others, uh, which is the, Jesus said the second most important law in all of scripture. And also in the middle of that is the biblical command to obey our uh, governing officials and authorities, uh, as long as they don't contradict God's law, of course. So where is that balance? Are we getting a contradiction? Are we getting something that helps us uh, help one another? And the latter is how we at Riverside are uh, looking at things. Our decisions to keep ourselves from meeting together in public, in person, I should say, are geared towards our, our love for one another, our desires to keep one another from getting exposed to this virus. If uh, I or someone else is carrying it and comes into a church, we sit together for an hour like a normal service would be. The science tells us that that would um, have a high risk of people getting the virus who are here worshiping with us. And the risk to those who are our uh, most common uh, demographic who worships together in person with us at Riverside is that 65 year old and over with underlying health conditions. So uh, our goal is to serve them and to love them by helping them stay uh, away from situations that would put them more likely to get this disease. So that is why we have decided to uh, stay closed. We are uh, looking into um, and thinking about when and how we should reopen, what that'll look like, but just be aware it won't look like it did in February. Uh, things have got to change some, at least for the, the short term future in order to continue to protect and to serve uh, those that we care about. Um, so please be patient. Please continue to enjoy the uh, videos as you have been and share them. Uh, but please, most of all, worship. Worship along with these, uh, the recorded music, the recorded sermon. Uh, read along in your scripture. Pray. You can worship uh, at home. Uh, you can worship together with whoever you are sheltering in place with or you have you do have contact with. Uh, so the command that we have to worship the Lord our God is still one that we can fulfill and it should be our joy to do so. So please don't take this season as a, well, I'll just sit back and have to listen to church. I'm a, a spectator, like watching a, a sports game or a movie. Uh, this should still be an active worship experience. Uh, hopefully you can uh, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, as Jesus says uh, he deserves and we should do. Right. By way of announcements uh, and prayer requests, we do have some praise reports uh, since the, we've entered phase one. Uh, Terry's wife, Mila, has been able to go back to work uh, cleaning uh, some of the places down at the beach, doing that deep cleaning that needs to be done before uh, people can go out and maybe enjoy uh, their properties or rentals and things of that nature as they start to open up. So uh, some of those uh, working businesses, cleaning businesses are, are back up and running and Amila is back at work. Uh, I've talked to Miss Ethel and she seems to be doing uh, fairly well. Uh, last time I spoke to her, she was feeling good about being up in Ohio. You know, it wasn't too long after she got up there and we know she often gets uh, lonely for home when she is out uh, visiting her daughter and others in Ohio. So I don't know when, uh, if she'll be coming back home, but we do, uh, we do praise the Lord that she is doing better that she is feeling well and uh, is not alone right now. Uh, Bill and Sandy Blanchard asked me to ask you guys to pray for their children. Uh, that is Darren and his wife, Heather. Uh, they are trying to sell their house in Seattle and um, just 
want prayers for patients uh, during that process and the right buyers and the right new place for them. Uh, they're moving uh, hour or two north of Seattle. So please be in prayer for Darren and Heather. I heard this morning from Gary Draper that he and Jacob are going to move this Monday. That is uh, the day after tomorrow. I'm recording this Saturday morning. And I heard from him that he has sold his house and he's moving to Northern Virginia, uh, Culpeper, Virginia is the name of the town, uh, to live with his son and his young grandson. Uh, they have some extra rooms in the house and they're moving in up there. So we would like to, uh, of course, pray for Gary and Jacob as they make this transition. And uh, of course, uh, we'll miss them and hopefully see them sometime if they come back down and visit. Uh, as always, if there's anyone else you want to share with me uh, and privately or for the whole church to be able to pray about or praise the Lord about, please get in touch with me. Uh, email me, jasonardaydavis at gmail.com or uh, call and text me, call me, uh, swing by the house, drop me a letter. Uh, you can get up with me just about any way. Uh, I'm completely available. Right? All right, let's go to Lord in prayer and then we'll enjoy the first song of this morning. Holy Father God, we do thank you for uh, the technologies that let us uh, share in worshiping together, even though we're not in the same place. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless the music and the worship leading that has been provided uh, by our musicians. And I pray, Lord, that everyone who listens to this will draw close to you, will enter into a spirit of, of quiet, uh, of worship, and of hearing you uh, lead them by your spirit to teach them your ways and i pray lord for a refreshing and a renewal in our hearts and in our minds that we are yours that we even though we don't know what is going on what is going to happen we don't know uh, how things are going to change in the future we know that you are ultimately in charge and that you have everything under your control so we ask that you would guide us, that you would comfort us, strengthen us, and provide for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, the first hymn today is a hymn that I hadn't heard very often, but it just fit in perfectly with today's message, and uh, Jenny picked out for that reason. It's called uh, Make Me a Blessing. And so they are going to be singing that. And if you know it, please sing along. And uh, we pray that the words of this song and the words of the message this morning from Scripture will uh, motivate us and help encourage us to focus on how we can be a blessing to others. So please enjoy Make Me a Blessing.
Now, if you would please join me in your Bibles in the book of Ephesians, it's the letter of Ephesians, still in chapter one, still in this introductory uh, sentence. Remember, verses three through 14 are one sentence in the Greek. Paul is praising the Lord for his wonderful salvation and what he does in our life. And it's so packed with truth that this is the, the third sermon uh, coming out of this one passage, and we uh, have hardly duplicated ourselves. At least I hope you don't feel like we've duplicated ourselves. Uh, today we'll be focusing on verse four. Uh, we're reading three through six to get the whole uh, some of the context, but we want to focus on Ephesians chapter one, verse four. Starting in verse three and reading, I'm reading from the NIV. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he, that is God, chose us in him, that is Christ, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Again, that refers to Jesus Christ, the beloved son. We've talked about a couple of weeks ago about being chosen, about how God chose us. And we pointed out in this uh, paragraph that is one big sentence in Greek, that all of the active verbs here are things God has done or does. He has chosen us. He predestined us. He sent his son to die for us. He has given us. It's all about what God has done. And so the emphasis has been consistently on what God does to save us. Now I want us to look at not what God did, but why God did what he did. And so if anyone uh, ever asked you, well, why did Jesus come and die? Why did God go through all that? Why does God offer to save us? I hope you would answer that he did it because he loves us. Uh, this is the, the message of the Bible. God has revealed himself to us because he loves us. He made us in order to have relationship with us. This is Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, the, the ultimate perfect design was for God to have a relationship. He came down and walked with Adam and Eve. He enjoyed the garden with them. Um, God loves human beings, all of us individually and as a group. So that's his motive. But have you ever thought about his goal, his purpose in saving us? Well, it's right here in verse four. He chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us. And there's some debate on that phrase, in love. Uh, the King James puts it at the end of the sentence that is verse 4 in English. Uh, most other translations render it, in love he predestined us. The King James and some say he chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. He wants us to be holy and blameless in love. Uh, and like I said, this is one whole sentence in Greek. The whole thing is one humongous sentence. So there is genuine debate among the Greek scholars about where that in love is attached to. Should we be holy in love, blameless in love? Did God in love predestine? And I think the answer is a both and. Obviously, God loved us. That's why he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16 uh, tells us God's great motivation, his love for us. But God also has told us that he wants us to love. Our great purpose is to love God and love each other. So our point, the point of making us, I think, is to make us holy and blameless in our love one for another. So what does this mean to be holy? What does it mean to be holy and blameless? What does God want for us? Well, biblically, holy is usually rooted in this idea of God setting aside something or someone as special to himself. 
Uh, the people of Israel were chosen to be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests that would point the Gentiles to their God. Uh, the tabernacle and, and temple and all the items in them for worship were set aside by God and made holy by God to be used in his worship. Uh, those things were holy. Uh, the Lord came and used the ground and the bush that was burning without burning up to talk to Moses. And God said, this is holy ground. Now I'm here. I'm using it. I'm setting this place apart. This is now holy. So the idea of being holy isn't, I obey all the rules. The idea of being holy isn't, I'm polite and nice. The idea of being holy certainly isn't linked in with our our success or the um, opinions other people might have about us. What is key to being holy is that God set us aside for himself. And that's what makes us holy. The same, the word used for same meaning is sacred. Uh, we have been set aside for a sacred purpose for God's chosen point and his, um, the good works he had chosen for us since before the beginning of time, as Paul would later put it. We have been pulled aside out of the normal world, out of the normal fallen people, even though we ourselves were also fallen people. Not because we would become something wonderful and sacred and religious, God didn't pull us aside because we are something so special. I hate to burst your bubble, but if you have that bubble, it needs bursting. God didn't love you because you are wonderful. God doesn't love you because you follow all the rules. God didn't love you because he looked down throughout the tunnel of time and saw that you would become someone who followed all the rules. Because that would mean we earn it. That would mean we eventually come to deserve it. And that's never the case. He has chosen us, Paul says right here in our passage, according to his pleasure and his will to the praise of his glorious grace. We were chosen because God can show off in our life. And he shows off in our life because we're so lowly and fallen and limited that what he can do through us shows his glory it shows his grace and it shows how his mercy has poured out on us because we didn't deserve it and that's what makes our relationship with god so wonderful and at the same time it should keep us humble and at the same time it keeps us worshipful and thankful and grateful because he has done it to us and for us and inside of us he has called us, chosen us to be holy. He is the one who makes us holy. Jesus did that on Calvary. He removed our sins if we would just trust in him and repent of our sins. Now we do have to accept his salvation. We do have to believe and we do have to turn from our sins in order for him to have our permission to take charge of our life, to really be the Lord of our life. And sometimes we're still going to sin and we have to turn away again and repent of our sin and confess them before the Lord. And he is faithful and just to forgive us. First John one. But the point of being holy isn't I get the swelled head because I am so good. I am so great. I have done so much good things. I have obeyed all the rules. I am better than so and so down the street. Our relationship with God and our holy standing has never had anything to do with our comparison to other people. God chose us for his reasons. God makes us holy. Dr. Hodge pointed out in one of the commentaries I read, if men are chosen to be holy, they cannot be chosen because they are holy. So that was very simple and very profound. If we are chosen to be holy, which is what divinely inspired scripture says right here, Ephesians 1, then we can't be chosen because we are holy. The Apostle Paul, who was known as Saul in the Jewish circles, 
began uh, the the story of him began in Acts as he opposed the church. He condoned the stoning of Stephen, one of the first deacons. He went about persecuting the church, bringing Christians into jail, even pushing for them to be killed, like Stephen was killed. And so Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and revealed himself that he is the Lord and the one that Paul is persecuting. Jesus said that Paul was chosen. God told Ananias, the man who went to Paul, healed him from the blindness of seeing the Lord and baptized him. And Ananias said on God's behalf to Saul, God has chosen you to be a light to the Gentiles, a message to the Gentiles. You're going to take my word to the non-Jewish people. But God didn't choose Saul because he would one day be a wonderful missionary and a church planter. God chose Saul to be the wonderful missionary and church planter. Let me say that again. It's fundamental to my point here. God didn't choose Saul because he would become a wonderful missionary. God chose Saul to be a wonderful missionary. Paul didn't futuristically earn it. God made him into what God wanted him to be once Paul submitted his life to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what it is to be called as holy, set aside, set apart for God's intended purpose, dedicated to himself, and blameless. Blameless is a word often used in the scripture to describe uh, the good sacrifices. The lamb without a blemish is a blameless lamb. It's uh, the same word. So God has chosen us before the world well, we began before the creation of the world to be holy and without blemish in his sight. He chose us for that. So he's the one who makes us that way. He chose to make us set apart for him. And this is something that we so often, I think, fail to get, at least fail to actually apply in our regular daily life. Because we weren't made for us. We weren't made for ourselves. I was not created and, and conceived in Joyce Davis to have my own life to do whatever I wanted. I was not made to be some kind of success or to be some kind of epic failure. I was not made because of the way other people would think about me sometime in the future, whether positive or negative. I was not made to... I was not made because I would uh, try to do the right things and obey most of the rules and, and be a good boy who never rocks the boat. I was made for God, not for myself. You were made to be holy, that is set apart for God, not for yourself. And that's something our society, I think, here in America, particularly has a hard time with because we're very individualistic. We're very much focused on me, myself, and I. What I can do for myself. Maybe what I can do for my family. But it's self-centric. Our, our hero stories here in America are very often people who pull themselves up by the bootstraps who work hard and get it done, at least the heroes of the last couple of generations. And I'm reading more and more that the, the current generations, the, the millennials and the generation Zs, etc., are facing more and more despair because they can't do that. The decks are very, very strongly stacked against them. But that was never our purpose in the first place. Your purpose isn't to be a good farmer. Your purpose may be to be a Christ-like farmer. But your purpose has nothing to do with the success of your crop. Pleasing God has nothing to do with how much money you made. It has little to do with how much money you gave unless you give it in the good, generous heart of loving others before yourself. 
It doesn't have anything to do with your social status. I bet we get to heaven and we meet saints who were honored wonderfully by the King of Kings that we have never heard of, that never made the first ink blot in any history book. But they followed the Lord completely in their communities, in their situations, and devoted themselves to Him like He made us to do. We are not made for ourselves. Jesus says in John 10, 10, that he came that we may have abundant life. But that abundance doesn't mean you're going to have an easy life. It doesn't mean you're going to have a materialistically successful life. It doesn't mean you're going to have a happy life on the whole of things. It doesn't mean all of your life is going to be peaceful and dandy. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but that's not Christianity. You're going to have an abundance of life. Which means all the things that come from having a life are going to be in abundance. Yes, there's going to be abundant joy, abundant peace. That is the joy of our salvation and God's peace that goes beyond understanding. There's going to be an abundance of love. There should be between our Father and us and us and our neighbors and our family. But not necessarily from other people towards us. There's going to be an abundance of persecution and hardship for many Christians. We are not made for us to enjoy ourselves and our life. We were made to glorify God and enjoy Him. To serve Him, to give that praise to His riches of grace, to give Him blessing in the small way that we can, like He has blessed us. Some quick examples of how this self-centric attitude has plagued our culture. Uh, we see it in parenting. I uh, have seen it, heard about it in my uh, brief role as a teacher. I taught in a um, K through ninth grade school. They were building up to add 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Uh, some parents were very involved. Most of them weren't. Uh, as we have heard more and more from uh, school systems, from teachers, from principals, one of the major repeated problems is that parents don't care. Parents don't support uh, the education. They don't discipline their children. They don't raise their children anymore. And it seems as if, as if many parents are basically saying to their kids, you do you and you go ahead and whatever you want to do, just don't bring me into it. Don't mess up my routine, don't inconvenience me, and we'll get along fine. Let's be friends and some roommates, not parent and child. They don't raise, they don't bring to church, they don't teach morality right from wrong. They pawn them off onto grandparents, onto teachers, onto anybody else, and then complain when things aren't done exactly the way they would have it done. Some go to a horrible extreme. I don't want to be a parent. I don't want to have this responsibility of having a child. So let's kill it before it comes out and becomes a real child. And they have an abortion. More recently, a more recent and immediate example. This past week, I saw a story about a security guard in a Dollar General in Michigan, not one of the ones here in Michigan. And the state order in Michigan was anybody who's working in a store or any customer who comes into the store has to wear a face mask because of the virus spread. And so the security guard is there at the Dollar General doing his job and this lady comes in and she's not wearing a mask and he tells her to wear a mask because that's the law. And she kind of goes off on him and fusses and rants and raves and gets all up in his face. And he says the cashier, don't serve her. She can't shop here because she's not wearing a mask. She leaves. That same vehicle comes back. I think the news said 20 minutes later, her husband and adult son come out and shoot that guard dead. Because he told her to wear a mask. Now you are probably saying, wow, that's horrible, and most people aren't like that. Well, no, they're not, thankfully. But look at the root of that violence. 
she thought her right not to be inconvenienced, one, exists. No one has the right not to be inconvenienced. No one has ever guaranteed a convenient life every step of the way. But she thinks this right to do what she wants overrides the state law and overrides his right to have a life. And she goes home and complains to her husband and her son and they take up arms literally and go and shoot a man for doing his job to tell her to wear a mask. In addition to armed assaults at Dollar Generals, there have been armed protests done in our nation. Several states uh, in recent weeks have had armed protests for the shutdown or the government not opening up as quickly as people thought they should. Again, it's another sign of this self-idolatry. Uh, what I want to happen, what I think should happen, that's the only thing that should be allowed to happen, and my way is the only right way kind of attitude that seems to plague this nation and is showing up in, during this time of pandemic. The church should be different. Uh, Paul says here in Ephesians 1 that we are holy. God called us to be holy and blameless. Since we're supposed to be set apart for God's purposes, we are supposed to be different from the unredeemed worldly people. And this is one way the church must show our distinctive, our distinctiveness, our difference compared to those who do not have Jesus. We must be more patient. We must be more other focused, other people focused, not self focused. Now, it's completely fine for us to have disagreements about um, what policy we think should happen, what we uh, believe the best uh, scenario would be or the best response would be. This is how we make informed uh, political decisions, voting decisions. This is how we let our voices be heard in intelligent, clear ways by our governing officials, as is our civic duty. But to attack others for having a different point a view, a different uh, priority, a different um, motive than, say, the economy. Uh, some of you I know want everything opened back up as quickly as possible because you're worried uh, about the uh, the economy, the needs of the jobless, the needs of the folks who to get back to work. Um, we're worried about what the financial repercussions of this shutdown, or if you would call it that, or just say in shelter order, uh, are going to have on us. Others are worried about uh, people's health, about what is going to happen, especially to the, the seniors and the ones with underlying medical condition. This virus is still very much an unknown. It has been spreading quickly. Uh, some of you are concerned because the numbers uh, are questionable. There have been reports and valid seeming reports of numbers being doctored to make it look worse than it is. So we have all of these concerns and it's okay to have all of them together. You know, people can be worried about the economy and wanting to help others stay healthy as well as questioning and thinking rationally and critically about what we're hearing in our uh, popular media, which is uh, questionable at best and has been for a long time. But the problem I'm wanting to, po to point out is that we as Christians should take those concerns, those thoughts, those goals, and while presenting them, present them in a way that emphasizes the fruit of the Spirit we get in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, and self-control. Those things will show that we are different from all of the reactionary people who are out there clamoring, raising up arms, literally sometimes, figuratively others, people who are going uh, about their, their day and they, they seem like they can't avoid insulting, putting down, and demonizing somebody else. God has called us to be set apart and different from the world. Not focus on self, but focus on others. So whether you're, you're fearing how bad the coronavirus can be, or whether you are 
probably flaunting your indifference to uh, the government's order. Know that there are legitimate concerns on the other side. Know that there are people in the middle. And know that whatever you're asked to do for someone else is not necessarily a bad thing. One of the tried and true and continual marks of a Christian is our willingness to sacrifice what we want for someone else. It's part of what love is all about. Uh, again, 1 Corinthians 13, after the bit about the sounding gong and the cymbal, Paul says, love seeks not its own. Earlier in 1 Corinthians, he tells the same church that if uh, someone thinks, well, I shouldn't go and eat that idol meat that's in the market. It was offered and sacrificed to an idol of uh, one of these pagan gods. I don't want anything to do with that. I'm a Christian now. He said, that's good. They abstain in good conscience and good faith. And if some other Christian goes to the market and says, idols are nothing and all this meat is free for me to enjoy. Thank you, Lord, for providing me meat today. And he eats it with a thankful heart. That is good. But the point Paul makes is that no one should use their freedom to undermine, to put a stumbling block or to put down someone else. Our lives are not about us being proven right. Our lives are not about us getting our way. Our lives are not about us having what we want. We're getting what we think should happen. Our lives are about the Lord and about the other people that we can be a blessing to in and through our lives. We've gotten into this us versus them mentality that has corrupted and polluted our culture. Uh, Republicans versus Democrats, the mask wearers versus the non-mask wearers, the people who um, right wing, left wing, pick a denomination. They may be fighting each other. And we see all of these other people with their other points of view and their other uh, goals. And we say they're all out to get us. They're undermining everything. They're horrible and they're evil and they're our enemies. Well, Jesus said, love your enemies. If those truly are your enemies out there and they're plotting against you, Jesus said, love them. That doesn't mean we get walked all over. It doesn't mean we become doormats, but it does mean we seek what's best for them. And it does mean we should be willing to let go of anything but the gospel for their good. Love is, what's make, is what makes us holy and blameless. And it's God's love in us that we should be shining out to others. Not pushing our agenda any more than we want the, the news or the politicians to push their agenda. It's fine to have our opinions. It's fine to be critical thinkers. It's fine to have our voice, and we should. We should also respect and protect others' voices and enter into these dialogues rationally, lovingly, gently, and with self-control. These are the sort of things that are fruits of the Spirit that show we are Jesus Christ's. We are not made for us. You are not made for yourself. You are made for God to use to shine a light in this world. And so often Christians forget that. Because instead of shining light, Instead of encouraging, instead of being patient and gentle and loving and kind and self-controlled and all the other fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, very end of the chapter. We get like everybody else. Fearful and self-centered and proud and so convinced that our way is the only right way and everybody else out there has to be our enemy. Well, Jesus said, love your enemy. 
Jesus said, love your enemy. He said, how is the world going to know your mind? By the love you have for one another. I'm tired of Christians treating Christians like trash because they decided to open up their service earlier, because they decided to keep it closed. Everybody calling one another names, implying their faith is greater than someone else's faith. Our faith is never about competing with someone else. Our faith is never about being better than someone else. Our faith is about what God has done to us and for us and what we should let him do through us to bless others. By showing them the light and the love of the truth of Jesus Christ. You are not your own. Your light, your wisdom is not yours. It was given to you by Christ. If you have knowledge and truth, it was revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. Knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. Christ would much rather us be ignorant and build each other up than have all the knowledge of the world and lack love. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, such knowledge, such faith without love is meaningless. It profits nothing. Someone who speaks that way is like a symbol banging that makes no music, just chaotic noise. We were chosen. We Christians, listen to me, church. We're chosen. Paul says here in this section, called. We were predestined. We were elected by God to reveal his image to this world. Going back to Genesis. God made man and woman to be image bearers of Christ. His image. He said this about no other animal, no plant, no star in the sky, heavens, nothing. But he said about people, let us make them in our image. And then he told people to reproduce and fill the earth. Our point from the very beginning is to fill the whole globe with the image of Christ, the image of God. That's our point. To be set aside for him. To reveal his glory and his image. So I ask you, are you his? Are you a well-polished mirror that is reflecting a godly image? Bearing the fruit of his spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control. Or are you a dim mirror? Have that self-centeredness, has sin, has pride, has any of those other things that take us away from God distracted you and dulled your reflection? Maybe you're not any kind of mirror. Maybe you're still an enemy of God, determined to do your own thing and go your own way. You've never accepted his forgiveness. You've never accepted this offer of grace that I talked about earlier that takes away our sins. If you would let him, he would make you holy and one of his. But if you don't, he won't push himself on you. And so you'll live your life without the joy, without the hope, without the peace, without the love, without all those things I talked about. And eventually die and go to hell. For all the rest of God's enemies. The choice is yours. Because God gave you that choice. And God will honor that choice. But he won't wait forever for you to make the one he hopes you make and accepts him. Maybe you've already accepted him. Most of our members, at, all of our members at Riverside are saved. It's required to be a member. Most of our regular attendees are saved. So I assume most of you watching this are saved. But are you reflecting him? Or are you living for you? Who's your life for? We have a hymn. I 
didn't think to ask for it until right now it popped in my head. Living for Jesus. That is the truth. That's the only thing we should live for. It's the only thing worth living for. And so as we listen to the final song, and it's one of my favorite hymns, it's entitled, It Is Well With My Soul. I ask you, is it well with yours? Has your sin been taken, not just part of it, but the whole? Do you know when he comes back that you'll be going with him? That's what the song says, makes the singer so at peace, knowing that everything is well with his soul. If you don't have that assurance, or you want to talk more about what it means to be a Christian and have that assurance with God, put a message with your contact info in the comments. Uh, email me at jasonlarrydavis at gmail.com or if you're local in uh, White Boy, Elizabeth City, uh, excuse me, Weeksville or Elizabeth City, please come by. Um, church is open. They haven't closed church houses, but they do restrict mass gatherings. But we can meet and talk. We can do it outside. I can do it with a mask, however you're comfortable. But don't put off what God is calling you to do.